There are a lot of different rumors about Scala in tech community. And one of them is that Scala is a very complicated language that requires years of preparation and experience in other programming languages. It's also a common thought that Scala is definitely not a beginner-friendly language. So I did my research, and one of the most impressive blog posts I came across suggested the following. You should start with the object-oriented part first by learning Python, Ruby, or C Sharp. Then you can move to Java to learn common libraries that you can meet in Scala. And after that, you can move to Scala, but only to the object-oriented part. And only after that, to the functional programming in Scala. I strongly disagree that all of that is necessary. And more than that, I'm absolutely sure that you can and you should enter tech industry with a programming language like Scala. And today we will talk about how to do that. So, who can learn Scala and why? I think the most uh, popular audience nowadays is students, since they just got from the universities and they're picking their path. I also recommend Scala for people compl uh, changing their career path completely for professionals from other fields, like um, economics or maybe medicine, retiring people, and of course, kids. Functional programming is like a fitness for our brain. It helps us to think faster. So, you decided for whatever reason to learn Scala. Where can you start? And the first question that comes to your mind is, do I need a computer science degree? Can you please raise a hand if you have a computer science degree? OK. I guess that's a lot. <laughs> that's good. Um, companies today are looking for professionals with a degree. It's everywhere on career sites. Well, I'm about five years in the industry, and I'm a physicist. All of the companies that I ever spoke with were completely satisfied with my degree. All of the people I've ever worked with uh, were either mathematicians or physicists or even philologists, but only a very small percentage of them had a computer science degree. So my answer is no. You don't need a degree. But you absolutely have to have a knowledge about data structures and algorithms. Because exactly that makes you a good software engineer, and exactly that will help you to do your job. So, you don't need a degree, but you need a knowledge. And what is also very important, a practical skill. Where can you start? I picked sources for you that I find the best. And these are books, Sites, Scholasty, REPL, and pen and paper. We will start with books. There are plenty of great books about Scala, but only a few of them are beginner friendly. I found one that will suit you even if you never heard about data structures, algorithms, or anything about four loops. It's Atomic Scala. That book is very slow. It explains in details every step you do without an assumption that you have a previous programming experience. Every chapter here is atomic, uh, which is independent on the previous chapter, and it has exercises at the end, uh, which are exactly about what was explained in the chapter before. It means you can open the book in the middle, read through the chapter, and solve the task after it, without a need to read 400 pages prior to that. I think that's awesome. Next learning source is uh, Scala Exercises. Uh, it looks like this. It has explanation, example, and a task. You need to fill the empty spots. That will help you out to understand the topic better and uh, to memorize the syntax of Scala. It also has a run button, so you can always check if you were right. Exercises here are split by frameworks, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can use it along with Atomic Scala. You read the chapter, and then you solve the task here. It's a very good learning combination. 
It's also good for an advanced specialist because it has frameworks like CAT, Shapeless, ScholarCheck, etc. I find it very useful myself, so I suggest you to try it if you haven't yet. For beginners, again, I believe it's better to start with Scala tutorial, then you move to the standard library, and after that to the functional programming. Those three will give you confidence uh, in your knowledge and your level of uh, practical skills. Uh, another great online tool is Scalasti. Uh, it's a cross-device friendly option with the minimum requirements. You only need internet connection. You don't need to download or install anything. You don't even need a computer to write code. You can use a phone or a tablet or whatever is available with internet. You type some Scala code, press the run button, and the result will appear in a, mo in a moment. With that available today, you don't have any excuses to not work on your professional growth in Scala. Scalasty will also save your data, so next time you open the page, your code will be there. Next thing is my favorite, it's Color Apple, which is an, uh, an interactive tool for evaluating expressions. I use it in the most of my workshops in Sydney. Um, it's a great tool uh, for anyone from beginners to an advanced specialist. For example, uh, if you're debugging someone else's code written in a non-functional way, you can always take the big piece of code with business logic, split it into smaller functions, and then execute each of them to figure out what is happening with your data. I also suggest you to get used to the terminal if you're new to software engineering because it's very handy and especially handy with Scala binaries installed on your computer. And the last learning option is pen and paper. It's a great tool to come up with a solution with before you will start coding because knowing Scala syntax is actually not enough. For example, to solve a differential equation, we can use one of many numerical methods. But to do that, we need to understand how it works. What worked for me in this case was to write down several calculation steps on a paper, and after that, it was really easy to write the actual code that will do the whole calculation. Companies today practice pen and paper during the coding interview, so you can be asked to write down code either on a paper or on a whiteboard, so don't be surprised. Uh, those were the sources that I find based for education and a couple of tips for you um, about learning. First, do not compare yourself with others. Yes, there are people that can start coding right away. Oh, my friend is already in chapter four and I'm still in the first one, maybe it's not for me. No, it just means you need a little bit more time for those chapters. What matters here is that if you really have a desire to become a software engineer, you will become one. Which leads us to take it with your own pace. The whole idea of the right educational process is to have fun. I cannot imagine uh, learning something I don't like and succeeding at it. And the last thing, practice makes perfect. My advice for you here would be to Take just 10 minutes a day to practice in Scala syntax by solving small problems. You can use terminal, like REPL or Scholasty, it doesn't matter. But in a month time, you will feel a lot more confident about your practical skills and your level of knowledge. So, what about teaching? If you want to teach, I have three questions for you. Why do you want to do it? Where do you find your audience? And what's going to be the format of your lessons? One of the main advantages of Scala for me is that thanks to that language, I really love my job. Because our industry is growing very quickly, we need to learn every day to keep up with the new technologies. Which basically means in never stopping entertainment. And I want to teach because I want to help 
to people that are interested in functional programming to have that kind of job. What about the audience? I believe that uh, in advanced engineers can make their transition into Scala by themselves. But what about newbies? When I moved to Sydney, I didn't know a lot of people, and I definitely didn't know how to get someone to my classes. And then one of my friends suggested to connect with women who code, and I did. Girls helped me out with organizational part, and also connection with them helped me to get a lot of people interested in functional programming in Scala to my classes. So my advice here for you would be to decide who do you want to teach and find the existing group around you uh, with a similar interest. Facebook or Twitter should do the job. And the last thing, when audience's question is sorted, you will need to figure out what's going to be the format of your lessons. I find lectures in this particular case completely useless and I prefer live coding workshops with explanations. This way you will get an immediate feedback from your audience and you will have fun yourself as well. So, what do you need to know to create a good workshop? Uh, first, you need to take care of topics. Uh, second, timing. And of course, you will need help. Let's start with topics. Skull is huge. And because it is, how to split it into smaller variable chunks. Very simple. You don't have to do anything at all because there are tons of sources out there. You can take Atomic Scala or Scala documentation pages, it doesn't matter. One of my favorite topics for a workshop is Scala collection. API is very big, so what you can do here, you can take up to 10 methods for lists, like head, drop, etc. Uh, then Google 99 Scala problems. Pick the problems that you can solve with those 10 methods. Uh, prepare home tasks for your students that they can solve with the same methods so they can practice at home. And print the handouts with the summary of your lesson. Done. Next thing is timing. Since I work for Quantum and they support my initiative, I can run my classes in our head office in Sydney, which means I have two options. Work the evenings after 6 p.m. and weekends, anytime. From my experience, uh, work the evenings are fine, but they cannot be long, uh, since people will be already tired. You, I prefer up to one and a half hours. For evenings, uh, topics like high order functions is not the best idea for you or your audience. Remember that your goal is to show how simple Scully is. Uh, for weekends, you can take up to three hours and you can pick more advanced topics. On my first workshop, I made a mistake and I had a six hours live coding session with two rooms full of attendees. Somewhere in the fifth hour, I almost lost my voice and I am pretty sure um, my audience got lost track of what was going on as well. So uh, when you uh, deciding on the duration of your lesson, consider your own and your audience's ability. And the last thing, if you have more than five people in the room, you will need help. What I mean, get mentors. Remember to allocate some time before the lesson to um, install everything required for the lesson. Since your uh, workshop is practical, everybody should be able to code along with you. Methods can help you out with that. And also, uh, when your explanation is not enough, uh, they can help you with explaining something in different words. It all leads for a better experience for your students. It's very important. Remember that if your classes are free, which is my case, uh, you will ask people to invest their personal time to be a volunteer. 
I usually ask my friends or a local scholar community. One of the best advantages of teaching is the fact that you actually learn it yourself. So, you got topics, mentors, students, everybody in the room. What do you need to know to provide the best coding experience? First, <clears throat> first listen. It's very important to create an atmosphere uh, in a room where everybody will be comfortable to ask any question. And when they do, make sure you really listen. That part is very hard since you have uh, your own context and your own experience and knowledge. It takes time to learn uh, how to hear out the actual question that student asked. The next thing is ensure you really understand the question. You need to understand what student wants to know. This is your chance to show uh, the difference between what was asked and what had to be asked. Because most of the work for your students will happen at home, where they have Google and Works. And they need to know how to ask the right question to get a proper response. It's very important for the educational process. The following thing is explanation. Remember that your goal is to show how simple functional programming in Scala is. It means to not pick complicated explanations. If your audience is not a group of mathematicians, do not start your explanation with category theory. Avoid uh, confusing people or scaring them off with more and more complexity. There is a good saying about it. If you cannot explain something in simple words, there is a probability you don't understand it well enough. And I believe it's true. And the last thing, know your audience. It means tailor examples relevant to your audience. If you're working with people with Python experience, you can explain something uh, by showing the difference between Python and Scala to help them better understand the topic. But if you're teaching newbies, you will have to use imagination. Remember to use examples from real life. For example, what is an option? It's a box. It's a box with a value or with no value. You can use pictures, schemes, or metaphors all of that helps to understand functional programming concepts a lot better than anything else. Do you know who's that? So we'll probably recognize uh, Will Smith here, uh, but I'm talking about the child next to him. This is Tanmay Bakshi, a 14-year-old boy that became an artificial intelligence expert for IBM. He wrote his first program for iPhone when he was only nine. I think we need more kids like that. There are a lot of schools, programming schools, for kids as little as four years old. They can learn Python or JavaScript there. And it's really awesome. But what is really sad for me that we don't have anything like that in Scala community. Everybody remembers books that they read when they were kids, right? Who had Pinocchio as their favorite? Red Hood? Category Theory? <laughs> no. So how about Fairy Tale? I'm not talking about teaching kids Scala syntax, but about explaining functional programming concepts using a fairy tale language. We live in a tech world already. Everything around us is either soft or created by soft. And I think kids should understand at least how it works, which will be a lot easier if it will be presented in a fairy tale form. I'm working in a book for, uh, about Scala for kids, very little, from three years old. And I'm hoping that will show them how interesting functional programming world can be. Uh, the work on the book is still in the progress, and I'm using the Sonom user demo sessions to uh, collect feedback from my future readers and their parents. 
I hope there will be a great engineers in 10 years. So, uh, we spoke today about how we can learn Scala by picking a fun path and how we can teach kids, newbies, and software engineers. And worth to mention that if you want to build a product that will cover needs for of all people around us, uh, we need to create a diverse team with different experiences and different point of views. So I guess that's it. Thank you so much. You can find me this way. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer, or you can find me later if you want. I cannot see anything, so if there are questions. <laughs> It's like light everywhere. Hi. I was helping to run the Creative Scala. I'm over here. I think, yeah, that's fair. Creative Scala that, that took place um, here yesterday. One of the biggest issues we had was the installation and setup. So um, I'm curious to know whether you run everything in SCASTI or you um, have some other way of getting people set up and running that you find works for you. Uh, so you had like a workshops, or is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Scala Bridge um, uh -huh. workshop. That was yeah. Yesterday. Okay, I got it. Uh, so yes, we we had issues with installation as well. Uh, on my first workshop, I decided to go with IntelliJ, and for people that are new to tech industry, that was um, challenging. And for mentors, uh, it. It was six people who helped me out uh, that day. It was challenging as well. We had to install everything for everybody. So in cases when we had no time, and after that, also I'm using Scala SD most of the time when we cannot uh, install uh, Scala binaries for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, Scala SD is a good uh, actually thing to run a workshop if it's not something like a huge application. But uh, from my experience, uh, building a big application on a workshop is not the best idea. But is that what you were doing, the application? Uh, it's small stuff. It's uh, fairly small stuff, so there are a few issues there. One is definitely like installing IntelliJ and so on just is difficult. The other issue is that it's a, a fairly atypical workflow. We don't really have a compile test workflow. People are making very small changes and just going through compile is tedious um, for the very <laughs> small changes they're doing. So working directly in, in like the console yeah, or yeah. is sometimes easier. Yeah, um, uh, REPL is great, yeah. uh, except for the cases when you, um, you're working with traits and case classes that or yeah. big functions. It's like harder to print and you need to explain how to absolutely. Print it for yeah, there's other problems with <laughs> just using the REPL. And the people can't do any code that's longer than a few lines, and it's really there's not a great solution that I know of. So I'm um, maybe the SCASTI, I don't know how you pronounce it, Scala Fiddle type sort of thing. Yeah, is is the way forward. I'm not sure. I, I think Scala C is like a default case for any workshop. I would use it. Right. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I am the IntelliJ Scala team, and we are aware of these problems. So uh, we've we started to address it by creating a basically one-click installer. So basically, you just download the thing and start it, and you can start uh, hacking on a Scala project. And we're also going to make the interactivity a bit better by improving the worksheet feature and hopefully generally making it easier to use for beginners. That's great. Thank you. So uh, I, I do a lot of Scala teaching at my workplace. And uh, I liked your slide about the option with the box and the apple. I, I have a lot of trouble myself 
finding good analogies for functional programming to use with people that are new to the concept or don't know what category theory is or whatever? Like, how do you get inspired to, to find good analogies for, for non-functional programming ninjas? I, I actually don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's just, just comes naturally. <laughs> well, well, actually, if you're trying to abstract from everything that you have in your head, like mm -hmm. all the algorithms and data structures that you have, uh, you can try to imagine something that looks alike, mm -hmm. maybe. Like how to explain what a map is, right? I mean, the data structure, like a dictionary. <laughs> this is what works for mm -hmm. my students. I don't know, maybe another audience will be mm -hmm. um, keen to a different uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. But things work. Uh, map, you can show the map how it works. Like uh, you can have different boxes, right? And you're doing something with one value in one box, what, mm -hmm. what map function does, right? It does the same to each element. So you can show that. You can show that physically even, if you're working like with the little kids, for example, that, that works mm -hmm. very good. How do you explain mapping on futures? What? How do you explain mapping on futures? That's futures? the one I always have trouble, futures. Like Scala futures, future <laughs> yeah. dot map, future dot flat map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't do that for future. I didn't do that. <laughs> we got to flat maps. Mm -hmm. That's good enough. Thank you. Hi, I'm curious Hi. to know uh, how advanced are the topics uh, that you're explaining to your your children, students. Like how, children. Fa how far do you get? Uh, with three, four years old, um, we're sticking with uh, fairy tale characters that um, show, uh, I guess, the, something, the, the, the idea of something like uh, little traits, for example, it's a different figures that can play together, something like that. It's not published yet, so I cannot, I, I actually had a couple of pictures in my slides before, but then I realized that since I haven't published the work yet, I cannot kind of show it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, not, uh, it's not numbers even, not even numbers. It only metaphors and figures not very advanced, so we know what a trait is, what a collection is, right, what a tuple is. Okay, I just thought there was some magic to help explain futures and things like that, that for, to children, so, cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, futures is not something that's gonna happen for three years old. So, um, do people always work individually on concepts that you're tra training them, or do you have um, some of the students collaborate together, either on like a group project or maybe like pair up? I'm, I'm just curious how that works. Uh, I'm sorry, is your question about uh, how? Like, so, when you do the workshops, let's say, and you're mm -hmm. you're telling them about how options work, and you're explaining, that, okay, we're going to type in these things into into here, and we're going to uh, see how this works. Do they all work on it individually, and then do you have a mentor come around and help them if they have trouble, or you help them yourself, or do they work together? Do you have like students pair up together? Oh, got it, got it. Uh, they all work individually. So th the question is about uh, the form of the workshop. They all work individually, uh, each of them on their own computer. Uh, recently, I allowed to uh, have kids uh, with parents in a workshop as well, and they will work on, on one computer with a parent. Uh, but for adults, uh, they work by themselves. Uh, and I usually interact with them like, okay, we have a task. Uh, here is how you can solve it. Think about it a little bit, like a couple of minutes. Then raise a hand if you, if you solved it, and two hands if you have a problem. So that kind of thing helps to uh, to wrap a bit, uh, everybody, and uh, makes it not really formal. So it's not a class, it's not a lecture. It's something that uh, 
we're talking about something, we're doing something together. I'm showing things in terminal, like I'm using REPL, uh, and I usually have like two windows split it in terminal, so uh, on the upper side, I will have some examples that has to stick there, like basic functions that how they work. Head will do that to list, tail will do that to list, so they can take a look at that all the time. And on the uh, lower level, I'm just coding and showing them the middle results. I'm explaining things, and I can see from, from their reaction if they understood uh, the topic or not. If, if not, we're repeating things. Uh, repetition is actually very good, and this is the reason why I suggest to prepare home task uh, tests for, for your students so they could do the same things, maybe for a little bit different problems, but with the same methods, so they will repeat it and memorize that. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question about uh, logistics. Um, so uh, in, when you do a workshop, uh, is everyone required to bring their own laptop? And um, what if, for some reason, someone couldn't do it? And do you have some solutions? Oh, yeah, if, if they all have to bring the laptop and what to do if they don't have it. Yeah, they, fortunately, uh, I have only classes without computers. Uh, I only, uh, um, I, I'm using like a boarding rooms uh, for um, client meetings. So everybody uh, should bring their laptop and we will help to install them, everything that required for the class. So after that, they will be at least able to do that at home, right? That's very important. Uh, at the moment, we're not available to provide classes, but no computers, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, my question is why you would uh, choose to teach uh, newbie Scala instead of, say, something like Python, uh, since Scala, right off the bat, has some more advanced restrictions, such as you know being typed. Uh, it's focused on immutability. Uh, the syntax reuses keywords for different purposes a, lo a lot. And I'm wondering why uh, why start with with Scala for beginner programmers? Well, I believe it's uh, it's a better start from my experience, because I started with Scala and it turned out okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I truly believe that Scala is not something that people think about it. It's not complicated. And it's a truly beginner-friendly language. So it's better to start with something that is strongly typed, that does the right thing, instead of some other programming languages. Uh, we're all here about Scala, so I guess that's not really a question I can answer in a different way, right? I love that language, and it, it inspires me to teach other people. This is what I do. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to actually add to your, like, why teach to beginner, because I do the same thing. And wow. one, one little cute anecdotal an example that I have for teaching some beginners. So I had a few 15-year-old girls who had never used a laptop, really. They had, like, an iPad. And uh, we were like, oh, well, this is going to be a disaster, teaching these kids that have, don't even know how to use a computer, <laughs> like, to program with Scala. And there were a bunch of people who were also JavaScript programmers who wanted to learn Scala in the same room. And what happened was the immutability and the types actually uh, you know, made things more intuitive for them. And the JavaScript programmers were like tripping over themselves because they're like, I, I want to reassign this. And these, these two 15-year-old girls were like, but why? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. You just transform the thing and you get a new one and then you just use the new one. And they were explaining that to the JavaScript programmers, which I thought was really funny because I thought that would be hard. Because when we learned, we learned, oh yeah, let's you know mutate the world, uh, and then we're like correcting, we're overwriting what we learned when we learned you know to program in Scala. But when you teach somebody who has no experience 
for at least my experience has been that that's actually more intuitive than like overriding things and trying to keep uh, track of some state in your mind and whatnot. And they were like, it was kind of cute because you have some, some people who had been doing JavaScript development for years being corrected by two 15-year-old girls <laughs> who thought it was super intuitive to, to keep things immutable. So I, I think that actually, I, I agree with you, it's actually very beginner friendly. And I think that you only see that when you teach a beginner. Uh, and then they make all of these assumptions that we had to learn and work to learn. So I, I agree with you. Thank you so much. That's awesome, 15-year-olds. I'll get there. Hi. So my question is, <clears throat> when new developers come, I'm also trying to teach them. My question is, how far do you take the functional part? Because this is always a question. Because Scala, in a way, it's between the Java and the Haskell like edges. Functor, monads, do you teach them that? Like option is something that I, I can, you know, Schrodinger box, you can actually look at that, Schrodinger cat, I mean, like you can teach that, but functor, monads, things like more complicated, uh, do you teach that or do you save it for later after they'll be more comfortable? How, how, how deep do you go in the functional part? Uh, thank you. Um, we're not in monads yet, uh, so the most functional we got is flat maps because we're still getting used to the syntax and everything. Uh, we need to understand that these are people without programming experience at all. They're very new to technology, to using terminal, to everything. I think we will get there, like maybe in the half of the year we'll be there. Also, I have Scala Micro in mind. So uh, we'll go through uh, everything that is important and interesting in Scala. Unfortunately, I don't know Haskell or didn't get a chance to work too much with Java. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm teaching the basics uh, in Scala and I think it's going well. But I I'm really proud of the students that I have because having zero experience and being an adult uh, doing such a thing is very cool, actually. So we will get to the monads and functors and everything. No problem. I also have that thing in kids' book, but in a very fairy tale form. Thank you. Uh, I just want to respond to <clears throat> you know, some of the questions about teaching advanced topics. Uh, you know, teaching beginners is a, a thing I've uh, I've done and and think about a lot. And you have to sort of teach to a person's interests and what they want to do with the subject. And uh, most people, you know, even professionals, often don't may use the more advanced features of functional programming very rarely. Um, you know, if you're making something like a web service or something like th that, uh, you know, often you're not going to to need that. So I just wouldn't bog down a beginner's mind with it. It just makes programming seem much less accessible to them. Um, as and that's time you could spend, uh, you know, solidifying the uh, the stuff that they're going to use every day. Um, it's not a question. I, I'm just saying that I, I, I agree with, the, with focusing less on advanced topics, especially for beginners, because, uh, you know, you don't need to... Uh, it, I agree. It's better to spend time on things people are going to use every day for things they find interesting or want to work on uh, than to tell them, okay, there's a world of complicated stuff out there. I'm going to show you, you're not going to understand and you're never going to need to use it, but I just want to you know programming is more complicated than, than you can imagine. That's not useful, you know. It just yeah. demoralizes new beginners, uh, uh, new programmers, I think. So I think it's good to focus on the, the basics. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, thank you. It's better to uh, be stronger in a simple way of expressing uh, the business logic than being too smart. 
Yeah, because somebody will have to support that after you. Anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I cannot see it, unfortunately. So. No. That's it? Okay, thank you so much.